my kind of background, I studied engineering and it was a long time ago when everything was in black and white and it looks a bit like that. Um, it was actually mechanical engineering I studied, so I, I kind of didn't want to be a mechanical engineer. I ended up setting up a software business that I turned into a digital agency where everyone kind of looked a bit like that in, in the sort of t t 2006. Um, had a lot of fun. We worked for lots and lots of different brands, lots of different sectors, and not just not just financial services. But I decided, uh, well, actually, what happened is we were bought out by an advertising agency. So I became a, a CTO of an advertising agency. The slide says it all. <laughs> I, I I kind of sort of uh, enjoyed doing a lot of. We did a lot of very cool stuff in 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 advertising on the kind of ad tech side of things, but. Um, ultimately, I, I wanted to go and work client side rather than sit in an agency. I wanted to kind of go and help help clients build internal capability. That's something I'm very passionate about. I know it's something that can Contino also very passionate about. Really helping clients build build this capability in, in, internally. So that's kind of what I do. I build uh, I build uh, teams in, in, internally. I I spent. Uh, a, uh, about a year for the Ministry of Justice, building uh, systems in the prison and probation service, um, uh, built, running some internal uh, multidisciplined agile uh, digital teams. Um, I then went for a couple of years to Racket Bankiza, a uh, global CPG company. Um, we, uh, we at RB, we, we made all sorts of interesting products. Um, it's highly regulated because a lot of it's in, in, in healthcare. But we uh, we built a global e-commerce platform selling condoms online. People prefer to buy condoms online than go into a shop. So it was, it was quite quite a successful project. Also built a, a big data platform. I then uh, uh, towards towards the end of last year uh, went uh, to Open Banking as as an interim CTO. E everyone at Open Banking uh, Open Banking Limited is is an interim. Open Banking is a limited company. It was set up by the Competition and Markets Authority, the CMA, uh, last year. Um, and we are technically a sort of implementation entity. So open banking as a concept is, is massive. The implementation entity in the UK is a, is a limited company. We've got about 100 full-time uh, contractors. And our remit is a, a, a fairly tight remit around building a set of API standards for uh, retail banking. We are funded by what is called the CMA9. Some of you here from from the, uh, the the CMA9, the nine largest retail banks who trade in the UK. What open banking as a as a concept is all about, I don't need to tell you, but it's you know it's very exciting. It is, as I said, it's a very big thing. It's all about opening up banking and providing a uh, a, a level playing field and a lower barrier of entry for fintechs to create better uh, products and services that sit on top of banking. And that will offer much better uh, utility and value to to consumers. So uh, our our role really is um, creating a set of API standards. That's that's the core of that. The CMA remedies uh, are, are what kind of our mandate is to deliver the standards that will enable the CMA nine to fulfil those remedies. But really, this is a catalyst or a precursor for the UK to get, uh, a, 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 I suppose, a, a step ahead of the game in terms of ultimately the, 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 the bigger picture, which is PSD2. Um, so um, PSD2, as you know, came, came into force a while ago. We're in it whether we like it or not. Um, the date that the rules apply is the 13th of January, which kind of is the same date when the uh, read-write part of the CMA remedies are to be delivered by the CMA9, but as we all know, this is, you know, very uh, up in the air still because there is this thing called the uh, RTS, the Registry Technical Standards, which there is yet another final draft in in, in February, which is still being discussed, and um, the particular kind of hot topic at the moment, or the one that I'm most uh, f familiar with or concerned about, is. Um, the uh, the details of uh, contingency measures that banks may or may not have to do if if, if APIs stop working, which is a, a strange sort of solution to a, to a problem, but also particularly around this this thorny subject or topic of screen scraping and impersonation. So we're 
there's still a lot of debate about whether screen scraping should be completely outlawed or whether it should be allowed to continue as an alternative interface. That has not yet, to my knowledge, been, uh, uh, been uh, finalized. And at some stage, hopefully, the RTS will be finalized and then there's an 18 month window before it has to be put into place. So we are kind of operating in uh, uh, a, a sort of uh, environment where we are mandated within the implementation entity, within, within the organization I work in, to create these standards for some CMA remedies which are defined, but they are very loose, and also within the framework of RTS, which is in some areas quite prescriptive, but is still a draft, and yet we have to be live with the CMA 9 on the 13th of January. So it's an in, in, incredibly challenging environment, and not forgetting the kind of real, uh, the real uh, carrot or stick, whichever way you want to look at it, of GD, GDPR. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about what, what we're doing at, uh, at Open Banking. The first, the first phase that went live in, in March this year was the open data standards. So this is a dashboard which shows the CMA9, or rather it shows their, their brands and um, the endpoints for each of the open data APIs. So there are six endpoints. There's a ATMs, branches, personal current accounts, business current accounts, SME lending, um, and uh, SME uh, corporate uh, credit cards. And these are open data APIs which effectively are just static or near, near static product information. Um, there's no personal information there. And what we decided fairly early on was that we would put these out there in, in the public and ask the CMA9 to publish these endpoints with no security model, no registration at all, to treat the API endpoints very much the same as you would treat a public website, because all of this information is public anyway, and it just simplified things an awful lot because it <coughs> meant that there was no need to worry about who had access or put any sort of controls, controls or restrictions on that. So if I show you, for example, the, the endpoint there, you can click on uh, Barclays endpoint for uh, ATMs. You basically get the JSON there, and you can see that there are 2,130 ATMs that Barclays provide in, in, in the UK, for example. Now that 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 went live in, in in March, we are actually we're on a version one. We're currently going through a rewrite of Open Data. Now that it's out there and a number of people have seen it and noticed there are issues with it, what effectively the issues that we that we've had are around trying to codify information that isn't particularly structured or is structured very differently by different providers and trying to create a sort of standard for that is it was was quite challenging. So what we're doing now is working on a version 2, which will be the standards of version 2 will be published on the website in the next month or so. We don't yet have a timeline of, of when the CMA9 will adopt, adopt those, uh, the, those standards and when they will be live with version 2 endpoints, but that is our hope expectation that we will have a, an, a significant upgrade to this. Effectively, the, the data model for version 2 is a much simpler model. Uh, with better documentation, it fixes quite a few inconsistencies that we've, we, we've noticed. The really kind of interesting piece, though, is around the read-write APIs that, that, that we've been developing. And there are really three parts to this. So this is just on our public website, um, uh, where the read-write APIs version 1 is, has been published. And there are three parts. There's a security profile, um, which is very light on detail at the moment. We will publish some more details on that uh, on the website next uh, in, in, in the next few weeks. And then there are there's the, the read APIs, which we've called the account and transaction API, and then there's the payment initiation API, which is the write API. Um, just a little bit about the security profile. What we've created is a, uh, a sort of trust framework, if you like, where any authorized entity can be a participant, but they need to register or rather enroll with open banking and we have we are building an open banking directory now this is effectively we we do not make any business decisions about testing accrediting saying who can and cannot be on the open banking directory the open banking directory is a, a, a certificate authority and an identity provider not for end consumers but for 
to participants, so for third parties, for AISPs, PISPs, and for banks, ASPSPs. So this directory is a, a trust model where anyone who has got the, uh, uh, the rights to trade or play in this ecosystem, we, we, we manage their, or give them a, a facility to, to, to manage certif their certificates and, and, and their identities so that there is an absolute trust between the participants. Um, and this security model defines how that works and defines how the read-write APIs are secured using mutual TLS, OAuth2, and o o OpenID Connect. I will give you a little demo of that in a, in, in a second. The one point that, that you should be aware of is that, that open banking does, we make no, and we, are, we, are, we have no mandate to make any decisions about who can and cannot trade in the ecosystem. We are entirely dependent on the FCA in, in, in the UK and other competent authorities in Europe. So if the FCA says this organization should have access to open banking, then that then we have to allow that organization to enroll and to, to be able to trade in this ecosystem. Same thing with competent authorities in, in, in Europe as well. This is a quick demo of how, um, and it's a, a sort of made up demo, but it's a demo of how an account information API could work in a business context. Um, so um, I'm a switcher here, I'm on a website, I want to look at switching my bank account. I, uh, and, 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 and this API, the example here is a third party who's, uh, who are called BizCompare and they are using a bit of a mashup of company house APIs and, and open banking APIs. So the first bit here is um, entering a company name or number which enables um, the, uh, a look up to company house information. The second bit is uh, a list of uh, registered enrolled participants from open banking and I'm going to choose bank A. So what, what, what this service tells me is that I as a, I as a customer am going to uh, allow this third party, BizCompare, to have access to my company information from Company House, which they could have anyway, and to have access to my business account details and my transactional details from my bank account. Now, in this case, the, this, um, this API, so this BizCompare service, BizCompare are not a, a regulated entity. They're not an AISP. They're a customer of ConnectPath, who are a regulated entity, an AISP. I, click OK, I'm happy with that, and then I'm logged, I'm at the login screen of my bank. So the first, the first step that you saw previously was I'm giving consent, in, in a sort of legal sense, I'm giving consent to the third party, BizCompare, to have my transactional information, and I'm giving consent for them to have it for a specific purpose. The second stage in this process, from a, from a customer journey point of view, is I'm authenticating and I'm authenticating via an OAuth redirect to my bank or with my bank. So I enter my banking credentials, and this is where if um, strong customer authentication is enabled and the bank has, 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 has provisioned that, then the bank will, this bank A will require me to do my strong customer authentication. The third step is authorization. So I'm at the bank account, I am confirming that I'm happy for my bank to give my details to Connect Path, and it tells me what details. Now these details and the the, the, the language and the wording here needs to kind of, uh, and in the standards we're we're putting some some more deep flesh around this, but this this needs to kind of mirror what was given in the first step with Connect Path, the consent model. So the authorization needs to match the consent. The two things need to be need to be a match, um, and that's a kind of reinforcement of the fact that I'm happy for this, uh, th th this, this to be the case. However, what I'm not doing is I'm not telling the bank and the bank doesn't know what purpose I'm using that data for. They might be able to guess, but I'm not disclosing to the bank what I'm using the details for. I confirm that. And then effectively the API has made the call, has retrieved my account information, my transactional information. I'm now back on the BizCompare website. And I've got, some, excuse me, uh, I've got some information in the blue at the top, which has come from Company House and I've got some information here which has come from my bank account. Um, there's also 
all of this is, you know, in the competitive space, this is how Biz Compare and this, this made up company Biz Compare could do a, a, a sort of a, a visualization analysis of my account details. I could do some clever stuff around comparing my account, etc. cetera. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna go into any more details there, but you, you get the picture. There's a three-step process. I'm with a third party, I'm giving consent. I authenticate on my bank account, app or website, and I then authorize the use of that same data, that specific data. I'll show you on the APIs in a second where that where that works. Um, the other API that I, I mentioned was the, uh, the the payments initiation API. So this is um, I'm a customer on an Argos mobile app. I'm deciding to make a payment. So I'm deciding to buy this um, iPad cover. I can add it to my trolley. I can go into my trolley. This is all as it as it kind of happens now. Um, I decide to pay now, and the difference here is that what, what we've got at the bottom is alongside the existing payment methods, you can pay directly with your bank account. So if I click on pay directly with my bank account, I'm asked to select my bank, and the same process, I'm redirected this time because I'm on a mobile app, it's redirected to um, the banking website on my mobile app. If the bank has enabled deep linking on this login page, it could directly take me into my mobile app, my Lloyd's mobile app in this case, to authenticate. Again, the same rules apply. If the bank is required to, depending on RTS, uh, to implement strong customer authentication at this stage, they can do so. I log in. So here, for example, I can enter my second factor. Um, now, so that's the authentication step. I'm now at the authorization step. It's the same, exactly the same process. I'm in this authorization step where I'm asked to confirm that I actually want to make this transaction. It tells me who I'm paying, whatever reference, the amount, the date. Um, I can, if the bank wants to, the bank can offer me alternative methods to pay. One of the uh, questions we've had around is around you know, different payment rails. Could it be a faster payments, chaps, et cetera. Um, so that's up to the bank how they want to offer, what, what services they want to offer. It could be a short-term <laughs> loan even. So you can choose, uh, change your bank account in this example. And um, sorry, and uh, away you go, confirm. And then I'm redirected back to my uh, Argos app and I've made the payment. So that's a kind of how the APIs work from a, from a read-write point of view. Um, what, what we've got is a uh, very detailed specification on our website of, of, of these APIs. We, we've got a, um, an overview, we've got some basics which explain uh, in, in the account and transaction API specification, for example, explain this kind of, uh, this, 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 this old dance, if you like, between uh, the PSU, the, the, the customer, the AISP, and, and, and the bank. There's a, um, a three-step process requesting account information, uh, sorry, four-step process requesting account information, setting up the account request. The customer is then redirected to authorize, to authenticate and authorize in step three. And then, uh, the, then the ASPSP on authorization, the ASPSP is given a token which they can use to request the data and so the re standard sort of uh, API request response for, for the data. Now, the, with the account information API, we have a concept of uh, authorization tokens which can exist for a defined period of time, but also refresh tokens. So um, what this enables us to do is enable a initial authentication authorization process and effectively have a longer lived token so that as a customer, if I decide to give longer lived access to the third party, for example, if it's a, an account aggregator or an accounts package, I could give a longer lived access that the AISP could reuse that token or, or use a refresh token to continually access my account. But as a customer, I'm in control. I've said, I've said to both the AISP and the bank what data I'm happy to share and for how long, and that, that can carry on. So that means that this authentication and authorization process can be done potentially, depending on the use case, can be done once up front and then can be a long-lived consent. And the 
bank has got the option, either depending on the rules as defined with RTS, or if there is a fraud marker or some, something that the bank is not happy about, they can ask, they can uh, cancel that, that, that token effectively, and then the customer will be required to reauthenticate and reauthorize again. So that's basically how, how it works. One, one of the things that we've done, um, so in, in this we've, we've created quite a lot of endpoints um, for different use cases. So for example, we've got um, um, uh, an account. So if, if, if the customer has got multiple accounts with that bank when they authenticate, they can apply that same consent to more than one account. Um, we, we have a, um, a, a, a balance, so you can get a balance for one or more accounts. You can get a list of your beneficiaries, your direct debits, any products that you've got or your product information you, you, can, you can get, which are, uh, is, is a, uh, at the moment is going to be a referential link to open data. So if you're on product X, you could reference, you could get that reference of what product you're on and uh, either the third party or the bank could provide you with all of the details of your fees, charges, benefits. Um, We've also got a list of standing orders and then the, the list of transactions, um, uh, uh, the, the transactional information. And then what, what, what we have in um, the uh, security and access control, we've got this concept of permissions and permission codes. So what we've done is created a standard which enables fairly granular control that the customer has got over us to. So we've got a concept of account basic and account detail, and we've, we've kind of got this concept of basic and detail. So basic is effectively almost like redacted information, whereas detail is all the information. There's been a lot of talk about should we go down the route of redacting data, and our belief is we shouldn't. It should be the customer who should decide whether or not they want the third party to have all their data or not, and therefore we've allowed for both scenarios in the API. Um, so things like beneficiaries, basic beneficiaries detail is, for example, the difference with that is that whether or not you've just got the name of the beneficiary or whether you've got their sort code and account number, for example. Transaction detail is rather than the basic, which is just a date and an amount and a type, this is uh, the, any detail fields that we've got in, 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 in the transactional record. Um, in, in, the, uh, in the specs, we've got a very detailed data model. Um, so we, we explain all of the request response payloads um, in some detail. Um, we've got the J JSON objects, uh, example data, UML diagrams. We've got a complete data dictionary as well for, for each, of the, uh, each of the payloads. And then at the bottom, we've got usage examples with, um, again, sample JSON. So this should really help uh, banks implement these APIs and for third parties to consume these APIs as well. We've got a similar, um, a similar uh, specification, which I'm not going to go into. It's exactly the same structure for the payments initiation. Um, so one of the things that, 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 as I mentioned at the start, is that our scope is, is, is at the moment quite limited around version one is really tied to just the CMA remedies, which limits the types of bank accounts for, for, for these APIs to personal current accounts and, and business, small business current accounts. So we don't cover things like card schemes, wallets, et cetera, at the moment. Uh, we don't cover corporate accounts. Um, also, it's very much based on UK sterling transactions or UK sterling payments in, in, in the payment case. Um, so we are working on a roadmap. There is still some, some work to do to, to kind of get agreement and alignment across the industry. But the, 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 Regardless of that, the intention is that we've created a very kind of extensible framework for, for these APIs, which can be used either we can, the, the options moving forward is either we create additional standards that cater for the wider uh, remit of PSD2, or banks can take what we've done as a framework <coughs> and build their own PSD2, full set of PSD2 APIs on top of, on top of that. And, some will choose to do one, and uh, maybe, maybe some will choose to do the other. So, yeah, I, I can't be too m more specific than that about about the uh, uh, about the roadmap at the moment because it's still in discussion uh, around uh, around the kind of uh, what our remit is within the implementation entity. Um, but 
I think the, the, the key thing is we've created something that is you know, quite small, but it's also very achievable for this January deadline. Um, and you know, January, as I said, really is the, is the start of something. It's not uh, everything is going to be delivered in January. I think there's a, there's a what, however this plays out over the next few years, and, and you know, I think it's going to change a lot over the next few years, and it, you know, it's going to get very, very exciting. I think January is in itself exciting. It's the start of something. It's the start of something pretty, pretty big. And I think what, what we're noticing now is that there's a lot of interest in what we're doing, not just from the UK, but from, from the rest of the world, even outside of Europe. Uh, I think particularly around the kind of security model and, and how we've created this kind of OIDC framework on top of OAuth uh, as a security model. Um, last point, I suppose, and this is something that uh, um, uh, an ex-boss of mine said is that uh, about putting tinsel on the tree. You know, and there's, what, what we're doing is creating a, an API standard. We are technology agnostic. It's entirely up to banks how, what technology, how they implement this. But ultimately, you know, the API is only as good as the underlying, uh, you know, the underlying platforms and technologies. And for example, one of the challenges we've had is that transactional, I, ideally if you want to pull, out, pull a list of transactional records, you want a unique ID for each transaction. In many of the banking systems out there, that concept just does not exist. It makes it very difficult to, <laughs> to, uh, you know, to, to use these APIs in some, some, some circumstances. Another issue is about the, 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 real, the, the lack of real-time updates to, to transaction information in some instances. You know, payments are updated and a batch process uh, once 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 a day, and they're not they're not real time. And again, you know, if if you want APIs to do things that are real time, and the underlying system isn't real time, you know, there, there's there's some friction there. So, this concept of tinsel on a tree, I think, is an interesting one where you know you can you can make you can make something look really good. Well, I'm not sure that does look really good actually, but you can <laughs> you, you know you you, you you can dress something up, but you know um, it's it, what, what I think might happen is it might expose some significant differences between uh, between different different banking platforms that that will create some interesting uh, uh, debate and, and discussion. So that that was it from me. Um, really open to any any questions. Yes, but to my knowledge, not completely open standards, which are technology agnostic and um, have no licensing model or restrictions around them. So that there, there, there are, and I mean there, there, there are bits of it, but you know what we've tried, what we've tried to do is create something that's completely open. Um, we've so, for example, the security profile we are. Working very closely with the uh, Open ID Foundation's Financial API Working Group to create this as a, a kind of p uh, cornerstone or pillar of uh, of their FAPI, their Financial API Profile, um, and I'm not aware of anyone else doing something like this that's completely open. There are lots of people out there selling PSD2 compliant APIs in one form or another. Um, that's, yeah, that's that's my view. Correct. So this, yeah, this this is a version one, and it's very limited in scope. To uh, the the one of the challenges with with what we've been doing is we're creating an open standard where we are trying to get not just the CMA nine, but the whole industry to agree on stuff, and that just takes a, a lot more time. It's a lot more challenging than just going off and doing something and saying here you go. And and so the one thing that we could agree on first and foremost, and why. The payments initiation API as it stands at the moment is very limited. It's just a single immediate payment. Um, so the, the the core concept of 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 this could easily be extended to recurring payments using the same concept that we've got in the account information API, where you effectively allow for tokens or refresh tokens which give longer lived consent. So it would be fairly easy to create another version or a, a, to to kind of extend this API 
in a way that you could have, you, you would still have in this model, you would still have the same OAuth flow, consent, or authenticate, authorize process going on, but that could be around giving consent for transactions for you know up to a certain amount without any future authentication for a defined period of time and the you know the the rules around that and when authentication might need to kick in again some of this is defined although still not finalized in, in RTS around for example if, if 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 the bank has a valid reason to suspect something suspicious because they're taking most of the liability in this case they could require reauthentication at any stage um, and you know there are things like that which can kind of minimize the, the the risk of this but yeah I mean fundamentally we designed this whole kind of concept and ecosystem so that it can be extended in exactly the, 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 the way the, the thing that we're not allowing for though in this is for uh, a third party a PISP for example to have access to direct access via giving them the, the customer's banking credentials. It still requires an initial setup sure. through this OAuth flow. Very, very good question. So we, um, at the moment, we have a um, what what we're doing is we have a an internal within the program we we have a, a sort of collaboration space on Confluence where we've got about a thousand kind of uh, contributors across the industry from the CMNI and from lots of other, um, lots of other uh, third parties and challenger banks, fintechs, et cetera. So we are going through a process at the moment of uh, looking at lots of different um, requests for change. But effectively what we're doing is baselining this version one um, and it's now under change control. So there are three types of change that we envisage moving forward. So the first type is, we're calling them kind of defects, but effectively they are, in, in the context of an API standard, they are um, non-breaking in the sense that um, they are largely about clarification of things in the spec, where there's requirement for more documentation or clarification, or there are typos that type of, 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 of thing so they're kind of very minor changes that'll be a, a sort of uh, a, a version potentially 1.01 so that would be a defined as a, a kind of uh, d d a patch if you like so there is an expectation that we will issue a number of patches which will be published on the website and the expectation is that people will adopt those patches because they're largely going to be non non-breaking and largely it's about clarification of stuff. Then at the other extreme we've got a major new release where we're currently looking at what goes into a version 2. So for example things like, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to make any commitments at all here because it still needs to be agreed, but things like recurring payments where there's you know, no need to authenticate and authorize every time, that's, that's a prime candidate for that. And that's a you know, those things will be bundled together into a major release and we are looking at doing those on a timed basis somewhere between every three and six months where we go through a very formal consultation review <coughs> process and give everyone considerable notice about that when we publish that and when we expect that to be kind of implemented. So uh, there are kind of some analogies with how fa fast payments sort of manage, manage things as well. There's, there's a bit in the middle which is the tricky bit which is how you manage minor changes if if lots and lots of people decide they all want to change something and it's potentially a breaking change you know my my view is we we want to try and avoid that and push it into a next major release but if there's something that everyone agrees it's a breaking change but it just needs to happen that would go into a 1.1 or a 1.2 how we manage that we're still kind of wrestling with because it is it, it it is a challenge but i think it will be the exception rather than the rule I think what, what we're hoping is that things will either be a patch which is non-breaking or they will go into the next major version and we will just queue things up and, and, and do it in a very structured manner and give everyone considerable pre-warning pre -warning and time to, to, to implement.